Hey guys, today I'll show you a science fiction thriller TV series named C, season one. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The drama unfolds at the end of the 21st century when a deadly virus outbreak decimates Earth's population to less than 2 million survivors, all of whom are blinded. Centuries later, the ability to see has become the stuff of legend. Even speaking of sight is considered heretical sorcery, punishable by death. An elite legion, the highest rulers of the world, arrive at the foot of a mountain under the guise of witch hunters. Their mission is to pursue those branded as sorcerers, the sighted fugitives accused of evil magic. The villagers of Al Kenny at the mountain's peak sense impending danger. At the command of the tribe leader Voss, every warrior emerges armed and ready. Protecting their sanctuary from invaders is their prime duty. Each one takes up a sharp blade and dons a specially crafted helmet before marching majestically into battle. In this world, humans may lack sight, but some have evolved in unique ways. The sniffers can detect through smell the presence of others from miles away. Listeners can gauge the distance of enemies, and sensors can feel the emotions and intentions of adversaries, predicting their plans. With reliable information obtained, Voss delivers an impassioned speech before declaring everyone to follow him and prepare for battle. Meanwhile, the wife of Voss, Magra, was on the verge of giving birth. The sound of the battle horn, signaling slaughter, filled her with worry for her husband's safety. Paris, the highest-ranking censor, did her utmost to comfort Magra, urging her to focus on delivering her child, as that was the most pressing matter. Elsewhere, the witch hunters were stealthily approaching. Everyone held their breath, neither side daring to reveal their position. Despite their lack of sight, their keen hearing made them aware that the enemy was at arm's length. At Voss's command, a charge was initiated, and everyone sprang into action. A group took the high ground, unleashing a fierce onslaught that caused the witch hunters below to fall one by one. As the prolonged assault failed to break through, the enemy fell eerily silent. The intense quiet made everyone cautious. The enemy, acting on the direction of the attack, hurled a grappling hook and struck a critical blow, breaching the defense. A squad of daredevils climbed up the ropes, and a bloody battle was inevitable. Every blow was lethal. The combat was intense and relied solely on hearing and luck. A single misstep could mean instant death. The enemy, with their advanced equipment, began to gain the upper hand. In the midst of the fight, Voss stumbled upon a ladder and realized they could not withstand the battle much longer. He urgently ordered a retreat. At that critical moment, he unleashed his ultimate defensive move, cutting down a preset stone wall trap. The boulders tumbled down, crushing the enemy in an instant, bringing the battle to an end. As calm returned, the censor informed Voss that a large number of horses were still a great distance away. It was clear that the recent fight was merely a prelude. With their last line of defense seemingly gone, Voss instructed everyone to retreat to the village and regroup. At this moment, Magra had successfully given birth, and to everyone's relief, it was twins. After the joyous news, Paris, with a serious tone, asked Magra who the father of the children was. It turned out that Paris sensed that the enemy's target was Magra, due to her significant connection to the sighted fugitive named Gerla Morel. She speculated that Gerla Morel was the father of Magra's two children. Magra, who was pregnant before marrying Voss, no longer concealed the truth and admitted that the fugitive was indeed the father. As the warriors rushed back to the village, Voss ordered them to reset the traps in preparation for the impending tough battle. Afterwards, he felt his way to the cave to visit his wife and his adorable newborn twins. Despite not being of his own blood, Voss showed profound love and care for them. At this very moment, the witch hunter's general at the mountain's base had learned from a traitor that Magra, atop the mountain, was not only likely connected to the sighted fugitive Gerla Morel, but was also about to give birth to his child. Knowing that, the invading witch hunters were about to attack the summit. Their goal was to capture Voss's wife. For their own safety, the villagers soon surround Voss's house and demand he hand over his wife. But how could a man of honor tolerate such absurdity? Earlier, Voss would give his life for the village in a heartbeat. But now, facing betrayal from those he once trusted, he showed no fear. He declared that anyone who dared to step forward would be met with deadly force, and he immediately assumed a battle stance. At that time, some followers began to stand up in support of Voss. Just as tensions were about to erupt into violence, the top censor, Paris, burst forth. She told everyone that even if they surrendered Voss's wife, the witch hunters would not spare a single soul, given their ruthless ways. The only option was to follow her to the back mountain, where a suspension bridge was waiting to provide an escape. 
People exchanged doubtful glances, unable to believe Paris's words. The back mountain was known to be surrounded by cliffs, and villagers who had lived there for generations naturally did not believe there was an escape route. Amidst the skepticism, Paris was forced to reveal the whole story. It turned out the fugitive Gerla Morel had arranged everything. He had secretly built a suspension bridge for the village as an escape route, and this Gerla Morel was the former husband of Magra and the biological father of the twins. Everyone was astonished upon hearing this. In a world where everyone was blind, the legend of a sighted fugitive seemed to be true. With a mix of doubt and trust, Paris led the villagers, following the clues that had been left. They groped their way through the forest, overcame various obstacles, and finally arrived at the suspension bridge. Time was of the essence. Voss covered the rear, directing the villagers to cross the suspension bridge in an orderly fashion. As the witch hunter's ferocious dogs arrived first, they were halted in their tracks by Voss's daunting presence. The cunning general dismounted his Ferrari horse, following the dogs barking to the front of the suspension bridge. Believing there to be a cliff ahead, he halted his approach. While puzzled about how Voss had escaped, the cry of a baby made him realize there must be a bridge in front of him. Following the sound, he indeed found the bridge. To mitigate the risk, he pushed the traitor ahead to test the bridge's safety. Sensing danger, Voss swiftly cut the bridge's ropes, causing an immediate imbalance. As he prepared to strike again, the traitor halted Voss's actions. Despite some confusion, Voss did not realize that the arrival had already betrayed the village. He snapped his fingers, signaling the traitor to cross quickly, unaware that this action would plant the seeds of future disaster. Following that, Voss cut the last of the bridge's ropes. The screams of his men alerted the general to the failure of their mission. He quickly had his messengers send word to the queen, informing her of the events that had transpired. The messenger flew over mountains and forests, arriving at the grand and majestic Kanzua Dam, which was the palace of the world's greatest ruler, Queen Kane. Inside the dam, the massive gears of machinery were a testament to the Emperor's miracles. At that moment, Queen Kane stood unclothed, her eyes vacant and bewildered, but not afraid of her naked body being peeped at because everyone in this palace is blind. The old phonograph played songs, and amidst the soaring music, the Queen dismissed her servants for a fervent prayer. As the final Amen echoed, her prayers ended. Just then, the messenger brought news from the Witch Hunter General. The Queen, after reading the information with great alarm, immediately called a meeting. Everyone gathered in the candle-lit council hall. The queen informed them that a sighted fugitive named Gerla Morel had appeared and had fathered two children. This fugitive, a bearer of the evil light, was a dangerous figure. She reminded everyone that it was the evil light that had destroyed the world. There must be no light in this world. She then ordered her loyal warriors to capture Gerla Morel and his children at any cost, regardless of the sacrifice involved. Meanwhile, guided by Gerla Morel's instructions, Voss trekked across mountains and forded streams, covering great distances. Eventually, they arrived at a waterfall, the site of Gerla Morel's final clue. Voss was the first to descend the ladder, and after some struggles, he safely reached the ground. The scene shifts to a vast plain surrounded by mountains. The land was fertile, and the sense of long-lost safety made everyone ecstatic, helping them forget their long journey of upheaval and displacement. Paris reminded Voss that the witch hunters would not give up so easily. Voss, well aware of Queen Kane's ferocity, returned to the waterfall and dismantled the wooden ladder. Then, holding the twins in his arms, he basked in the warmth of the sunlight, vowing in his heart to protect his family at all costs. Afterward, Voss followed the information left by Gerla Morel and had come alone to the dense forest with the twins. He moved cautiously, feeling his way forward until he stopped by a large tree. As he deciphered the message on the tree, the sudden appearance of a roaring bear caught him off guard. He quickly scrambled to a slope, praying that his children would remain safe. The bear reached the spot just above Voss, sniffing and searching for its prey's trail. A cry from the children revealed their position. With the bear approaching them, Voss was frantic, trying to make chicken noise to attract its attention, but to no avail. In desperation, he found a piece of broken wood and threw it at the bear, successfully enraging it, pissing it off. At that critical moment, an arrow flew, striking the bear fatally. With the threat eliminated, Voss rushed to check on the children and confirmed their safety. It turns out the newcomer was Gerla Morel, who had the ability to see. 
He told Voss that he hadn't come to take the children away. Instead, he wanted Voss to look after them. The reason he had asked Voss to take the risk was twofold. Firstly, he missed his children terribly and wanted to see them and name them, one being Haniwa and the other Kofun. Secondly, he had a key to give to Voss, a key that would open a chest meant as a gift for the children. He asked Voss to wait until the children were 12 years old to give it to them. By then, they would understand the secret inside the chest themselves. Curious, Voss asked what was in the chest. Gerla Morel replied, it's knowledge. Perplexed by the answer, Voss watched as Gerla Morel walked away. For safety, not long after parting with Gerla Morel, Voss went to the chest's hiding place, as Gerla Morel had described. He felt his way upward, climbing until he quickly found the hidden cave. This was where the chest was concealed. After returning home, Voss and his wife Magra decided to open the chest to see what was inside. The first item they felt was a model sailing ship, which they thought might be a toy for the children. At that moment, Paris arrived just in time, as Gerla Morel had insisted that Voss ensure she be part of this event. Once settled, they continued to open the chest and found many books. However, Voss and Magra didn't know what books were and thought they were just pieces of bark. Paris excitedly explained to them that these items were the key knowledge to unlock the door to a new world, where all knowledge from the past was recorded. To understand the contents of the books, one must have the ability to see. Witch hunters had burned all known books in the world to prevent those with the ability to see from acquiring this knowledge. Therefore, the contents of the chest were incredibly precious. Magla was resistant after hearing this. She didn't believe her children would have the ability to see, nor did she want them to have it. In this world, having vision meant death, being labeled as a heretic, a witch, and other things, which would lead to being hunted by witch hunters and becoming fugitives, never able to live a normal life again. Nonetheless, this was a gift from their biological father to the children, so they decided to hide the chest and wait 12 years to figure out what to do. At that moment, Paris sensed someone else in the house and gave Voss a hand signal, indicating there was an invisible shadow lurking inside. Voss understood immediately and grabbed a knife to search, but by that time the shadow had already vanished. The time flashes back to the dense forest near the village where the traitor was calling out to the shadow. Just a few days earlier, the traitor had come to the forest with his aunt and found the shadow. They told the shadow that the tribe leader Voss was extremely cruel because his mother had violated village rules. She was burned alive. He decided to take revenge on Voss and asked the shadow who could move silently in secret and is undetectable in smell to keep a close watch on Voss's family and try to bring some information about the newborn children. The shadow agreed on the spot. Back to the present, the shadow fulfilled his mission and placed the information around the trader's neck and then left. The next day, the trader joyfully told his aunt that the shadow had returned with information. However, the information was not accurate. Obviously, the shadow had its own agenda. The aunt, after hearing a bunch of useless information from the trader, claimed that there was no use in getting such information. The trader then took out a bottle and told his aunt that it was a message in a bottle, containing the location of the village and a warning about the presence of witches here. He would throw two bottles into the sea every day, confident that one day the nearby villagers would find them. Due to the previous shadow incident, Voss suspected that the traitor was behind it. So he went to his residence to warn him not to turn his hatred into revenge. He threatened that if he found him breaking village rules, he would suffer the same fate as his mother. In a world of the blind, possessing the power of sight was considered heresy. Gerla Morel was such an anomaly dissenter. Moreover, he fathered two healthy children, both normal beings with sound bodies like him. Because of this, Gerla Morel became a fugitive, and his children were relentlessly pursued by Queen Cain for 17 years. The witch hunter general crossed mountains and plains, traversed dense forests and entered the wilderness, searching countless villages and slaughtering numerous censors, yet he achieved nothing and made no progress. The scene shifts to a long, narrow stone bridge leading to the dam, where a grand procession filed in, led by the witch hunter general himself. Queen Cain, who was occupied with bird watching, recognized the unique footsteps and knew it was the general approaching. With great respect, the general presented tributes and taxes, informing the queen that his term was complete and requesting her approval for retirement. Queen Cain's face showed sorrow, not because of the general's retirement, but because he had failed to capture the heretic Gerla Morel over 17 years, inadvertently making Gerla Morel's name known to all and publicizing his visual ability. She believed the general's actions deserved the death penalty. 
The general offered no defense and calmly accepted his punishment, only pleading with the queen to spare him the guillotine and allow him to end his life in his own way, as atonement. After a final kiss to the queen, he left with a heavy heart. The scene shifts to Alkini village, where the once barren wilderness had been transformed through the collective effort of its people into a village akin to a paradise on earth. In the quiet of the night, Voss sat alone by the campfire, contemplating the years gone by and the growth of his children. At the age of three, his wife Magra discovered the children could truly see, a fact that filled her with both fear and wonder. Paris comforted her by saying that it was all destiny's will. Then, calling upon Voss, they united in their decision to educate the children from that moment on, henceforth concealing their ability to see. As the children grew, they lay in their mother's arms listening to stories, played games with their father, learned skills and knowledge with Paris, and together they experienced the essence of nature, feeling the world around them. Time swiftly brought the twins to their twelfth birthday. According to an agreement, Paris sought out Magra to discuss revealing the secret of the chest to the children. However, Magra opposed this, fearing that knowing too much would make them too conspicuous. She preferred her children to have a healthy and possibly unremarkable life. Safety was her priority. Paris, with her foresight and wisdom, disagreed with Magra. Without informing Voss or his wife, she covertly took the two children to a room and disclosed the identity of their real father, as well as the secret of a certain chest. The son, Kofun, was initially unable to accept that Voss he deeply loved was not his biological father and ran out, overwhelmed. Haniwa, on the other hand, was very rational. After discussing the matter later, the two kids reconsidered Paris's words. By chance, this conversation was overheard by Voss as he passed by. He was filled with mixed emotions, a sense of loss but also acceptance. He did not blame Paris for her actions. The truth about the children's lineage was inevitable and could not be stopped. Paris approached Voss, interrupting his reflective mood. She noticed his sadness and offered comfort, pointing out that the knowledge and understanding that Haniwa and Kofun had gained in the past five years far exceeded expectations. The children were a force that could change the world. They would eventually leave the village to explore a broader horizon, and as parents, they should feel joy, not sorrow. After hearing this, Voss was left deep in thought. It was another bright day. 17-year-old Hanawa and Kofun, as usual, climbed to a high point to begin their studies. Not far from them, in a nearby village, a farmer was washing clothes when suddenly she felt something. It was the drift bottle of the traitor that contained messages from the traitor. Meanwhile, a newborn baby was born deformed, which disrupted the peace of Alkeni village. The main reason for this was the village's decades-long isolation, which led to inbreeding. After this incident, the village's priest approached Voss, requesting permission for the villagers to go out to explore and trade. They had had enough of living without medicine for their illnesses and without help for their needs. Voss faced a dilemma. He had to consider the safety of the children, but also the development of the village. Magra, drawing on her memories with Jur Lamarel, thought of a location. After some discussion, Voss decided to lead the people to the trading market, although the two kids wanted to join. Magra immediately refused their request. After 17 years of seclusion, the people of Alkeni set out. They followed the river, their hearts filled with joy. Unseen by the others, Haniwa and Kofun sneaked out. They too wanted to see the world outside. At this point, they were completely unaware of the impending danger. By the time they arrived, it was already getting dark. At the market, villagers from various places brought out their specialties and homemade goods to trade. In addition, young people lit bonfires, reveling in a sense of freedom and novelty, basking in the satisfying happiness brought on by their hormones. The next morning, Haniwa was awakened by some chicken screams. A villager's child had been stolen by slave traders. Haniwa had a bad feeling and turned to look for her brother Kofun, but couldn't find him anywhere. She quickly went to her parents to inform them of the situation. Meanwhile, Kofun was bound hand and foot, being taken by the slaver's chieftain to a trafficking factory. Soon they arrived at this rust-stained place. Guided by his daughter, Voss quickly found the trail Kofun had left behind. Following the clues, they entered a forest. A pile of burnt-out bonfires caught Voss's attention. As he was about to investigate, Haniwa saw a message left by Kofun. In her urgency, she read it aloud without thinking. It was then that Magra realized the children might have opened the chest. Otherwise, how could they read? After her daughter confirmed it, Magra was filled with grief and anger. She couldn't believe that these two rascals had kept such a secret from her for five years, and the silently accompanying Voss seemed to be involved too. After traveling some distance, Haniwa told her father that they had reached the last location and that Kofun was likely inside. 
Voss said he was very familiar with the place. Haniwa, puzzled, asked her father about it, thus uncovering a chapter of Voss's past that he couldn't erase from his memory. It's then revealed that Voss's family had been slave traders for generations. He himself was once very cruel and bloodthirsty, having done inhumane deeds. Hearing this, Haniwa couldn't help but shudder with fear, but her father told her not to worry. That demonic side of himself was buried deep within his soul. However, today, to save Kofun, he was prepared to awaken that inner demon. Voss didn't want anyone to follow. He didn't wish for others to witness his bloodthirsty nature. Bidding farewell, Voss set off alone to the place of his nightmares. At the grand and imposing Kanzua Dam, the witch hunter general stood at the center of a beam, muttering to himself, ready to jump off and end his life as redemption for his failure. Just then, the queen arrived in time, having received the message in the drift bottle. Voss came alone to rescue his kidnapped son. He entered with a hostage guard, and a glance was all it took for Kofun to recognize his father. He quickly stood up and uttered a code phrase, signaling to his father his presence. After ensuring his son's safety, Voss knocked out a guard with the handle of his knife, drawing first blood. The chieftain, hearing the noise, turned and called for assistance. The experienced Voss threw a handful of sand on the ground and crouching low relied on his keen sense of smell and hearing to take down two more foes. Using the echo of weapons scraping on the ground, he quickly found the wall and prepared his strategy before the enemy could expose themselves, ready to enter a berserk mode at any moment. The bloody scene shocked Kofun, who stepped back in fear. Sensing his son's terror, Voss told him to close his peeping eyes and not to watch as he prepared to continue his ruthless slaughter. The enemy approached slowly, their footsteps allowing Voss to pinpoint their location with his acute hearing. Using the wall for leverage, he launched a preemptive strike. Familiar with human anatomy, each of his blade strikes was deadly. The pitiful chicken screams echoed, hastening the demise of his foes. Sensing a rope swinging in front of him, Voss used a corpse to block a fatal attack and moved along the rope with swift steps. The next second, his blade arced upwards for a fatal slash, leaving his enemy dead on the spot. While the sound of the weapon scraping distracted, he also pinpointed the enemy's position, accurately predicting and throwing his knife for a lethal blow. The last henchman, attracted by the noise, faced no mercy, his throat cut in a habitual motion that left his body severed on the spot. Now only the chieftain remained on the battlefield. The rush of bloodlust made Voss seem possessed as he swung his weapon. A drop of blood fiercely splattered on the enemy's face. They listened for each other's movements, taunting while shifting their positions. When the chieftain shouted Voss's name, a secret past of his slave trafficking resurfaced, revealing that they belonged to the same slave traders. But Voss ultimately chose to step away from the group. The chieftain was bellowing about punishing his betrayal today, threatening to sever Voss's head. But Voss paid no mind to his grandiose claims. He lowered his stature, readying an attack pose. He flung his weapon, feigning a flaw. The chieftain stepped forward to chop down, following the sound. As Voss struck opportunistically, he was misled by the chieftain's diversion of sound, losing his target and disorienting his judgment. Seeing this, Kofun loudly reminded his father, exposing his identity. So the chieftain seized Kofun, touching the sun was like touching Voss's last straw. With a shout, the two charged at each other. With just one strike, Voss pierced the chieftain's belly. He then slowly approached the chieftain and lifted his head, ending their past grudges and today's hatred. Voss had rescued his son, and Megra and others had been waiting for a long time. Sensing that her son was unharmed, the mother finally let go of her anxiety. With everything settled, Voss led everyone back to the Alkeni village. Magra called the two kids and confronted them, asking what they had been doing over the years. The son answered his mother truthfully. Despite learning much knowledge, he had never thought of leaving. When this issue was raised, Magra asked her daughter's thoughts. Haniwa and Kofun were complete opposites. She wanted to use her knowledge to create a new world. She believed in stepping out to achieve broader development. Knowing she couldn't control her children's destinies, Magura could only reluctantly accept them. She told her children not to lose themselves because they have power. She also asked Voss to notify Paris to come over, wanting to reveal some truths about Gerlamorel to everyone. Just a few steps out the door, Voss suddenly had an ominous premonition, quietly sensing a looming danger. Right now, at the crest of the waterfall, the sole exit, the witch hunter general with his troops in tow, has descended upon the village with grandeur. What kind of people could compel a nation to deploy its entire army to endure a 17-year manhunt? These very individuals are now concealed within Alkeni village. 
A formidable force of witch hunters marches toward the settlement, their ravenous hounds baying with an insatiable hunger. Facing imminent threat, Magra rummages through her room for her father's relics. In such dire straits, it's evident how vital this item is to her. The looming peril stirs the villagers into a fervent state. Years of isolation have eroded their prowess in combat and defense. Their only lifeline now is to surrender Voss's family. Confronted by the villagers' blockade, Kofun draws a dagger and takes the most boisterous traitor hostage, carving out a chance for his family to flee. Alongside them in flight are Voss's staunch allies, as well as the priestess's daughter, Bo. They traverse a dense forest, and as they near their destination, Kofun releases the traitor, knocking him out with a single punch. Voss leads the group to the riverbank where, to their amazement, a Tesla raft without battery lies in wait. Amidst the children's queries, Voss reveals that he has been secretly constructing this vessel for years, all in preparation for this day, a day he wished would never come. But fate often defies people's wishes. With everything in readiness, the sizable raft still comfortably accommodates eight people. Urgency in the air, they hastily maneuver the paddles and push off from the river's edge. By the time the traitorous informant and the witch hunters arrive, Voss and his entourage have already vanished. The henchmen speculate that they may have escaped on a manual Tesla craft built by Voss himself, but not Elon Musk. Upon hearing this, the general reflects thoughtfully before devising a method to intercept Voss. Soon after, the raft reached the mouth of the Sea River, where the witch hunters had been lying in wait for some time. Kofun, who had sight, immediately informed his father of the situation. The father, in turn, used sign language to silently communicate to everyone to keep quiet and cross the river stealthily. The general stood at the river's edge. Anticipating that Voss would have to pass this way, he had stationed a substantial number of soldiers there. He first advised everyone to surrender voluntarily, warning of a massacre if they did not comply. After a lengthy wait without a response, the general's anger flared. With two strikes of his staff, he signaled the attack. Upon receiving the command, scores of soldiers began to submerge in the water. The narrow river passage was on the brink of a fierce battle. Sensing the movement, Voss dove off the raft. He listened quietly for the approaching enemy. A violent blow stirred the water, prompting the shore's grappling hooks to immediately lock onto their targets. The girl follower was unfortunately pulled to the bank, where she suffered countless brutal hits. More hooks were hurled, putting everyone on the raft in grave danger. The commotion grew, exposing their location and allowing the hunters to pinpoint them completely. As more hooks flew and more soldiers swam towards the raft, Voss realized the peril they were in and hastened back to rescue them. In that moment, everyone fought with all their might, desperately resisting. The guy, who was covering for the group, was overwhelmed by attackers. Haniwa wanted to help, but it was too late. The appearance of the traitor fueled Haniwa's rage and she drew her bow, releasing an arrow in anger. By then, the raft had left the narrow confines of the river and entered deeper waters. Later, over the vast expanse of the river, Voss and his family were drifting downstream. Sensing Voss's escape, the general asked the trader if they could still give chase. But the trader claimed to be injured and asked for help. The general, however, delivered a fatal blow, saying this would save him some time. He then ordered his men to return to Alkeni village and leave no survivors. The cold-blooded general was determined to pursue them to the end. Meanwhile, Queen Kane was convening a high-level meeting. As she brought up the news that the general had once again allowed the heretics to escape, restlessness began to stir among those present. They implored the queen to cease the pursuit, for this relentless hunt had kept the army abroad for years, not only depleting the treasury but also preventing many soldiers from reuniting with their families. Moreover, they all understood that this so-called pursuit was nothing more than the queen's personal obsession. It was well known that she pursued Gerla Morel out of unrequited love. Queen Cain attempted to justify her actions as the will of the gods, but to her shock, she was met with unanimous opposition from the high-ranking officials present. With a slow rise, she awkwardly yet gracefully excused herself from the meeting, ignoring the calls of her people. However, to consolidate her position, she decided to make an example of some ministers upon her return. In a show of assertive power, she went to a clubhouse where she was greeted by two of the highest-ranking ministers. After the queen was seated, they presented her with the gift of a bird, her favorite. But when the cover was lifted, a devious smile appeared on the ministers' faces. They had placed a venomous spider in the cage. Though she couldn't see, Queen Cain felt the depth of the conspiracy. 
It seemed that her decision to execute the ministers was justified. She pretended to ask the ministers to open the cage, then suddenly pulled one close and hissed that the whole nation and city wished for her disappearance, but she would not sacrifice herself for this city. Instead, they would die for her, and no one could betray her. The two ministers were then silenced. The next day, an urgent report from a close confidant arrived. The deaths of the two ministers had plunged the nation into turmoil. Protesters had gathered at the city walls, clamoring for the queen to step down immediately. Some of the royal ministers had already defected and rebelled. It was deduced that the castle would soon fall to the people's uprising. Hearing this, Queen Kane was disheartened. She knew it was all over, but what she couldn't have imagined was that the great legacy her father had built would be destroyed by her own hands. She walked slowly to the center of the dam, groping her way to the control center. Kneeling before the instruments, she spoke of her longing for her father and her repentance. Then, following the contours of the instruments, she found the control box. Since the people had betrayed her, she felt no need for mercy any longer. After hesitating for just three seconds, she decisively pulled the power lever. The engines immediately ceased their rotation, and the floodwaters began to quiet down. The dam, which had withstood challenges for centuries, finally ceased functioning at that moment. Due to the age of the construction, the walls couldn't withstand the millions of tons of pressure and the entire dam began to crumble. At that time, the queen still muttered why Jerla Morel didn't come for her, vowing if he wouldn't come, then she would come to him. Staggering down from the control podium, she seemed to accept that destruction was rebirth. In this moment, she appeared to let go of everything. The ancient gramophone gradually grew hoarse and finally stopped spinning. All the machines began to explode one after the other, and the immense pressure forced the river to erupt forth. The queen felt her way to the statues of past emperors of the kingdom, the last one being her father. She touched the statue, declaring the story of this place over, but her own story was just beginning. Urged by her loyalists, they quickly left the place. Atop the dam, a horse-drawn carriage had been waiting for a long time. They boarded the carriage and leisurely departed from the soon-to-be shattered place. Inside, the queen revealed a cruel smile. The scene shifts to Voss and his party drifting on a raft for a long time, heading towards a known sanctuary. At that moment, Paris took out a letter from her bag, handing it to Kofun and telling them that it was the last message Jerla Morel left for her, instructing her to give it to the children after leaving the village. Magra asked Kofun to read the letter aloud. As instructed, Kofun read that Jerla Morel had established a new kingdom in a place called the House of Enlightenment and invited the two children to join him in creating a new world. On the back of the letter was a symbol representing the ability to see. The message in the letter was clear, and Magra immediately understood what was going on. She warned the children that human nature is complex and thought they were not ready yet, suggesting they continue to grow and thrive where they were, rather than seeking out Jerlamaral's new kingdom. Haniwa and Kofun obviously disagreed with their mother's opinion, and for the first time, Kofun expressed that seeking Jerlamaral might be more appropriate. Hearing her children's thoughts, Magra felt a profound sense of loss. Seeing the disagreement among them, Paris suggested they vote on whether to stay or go. Voss naturally stood by his wife's side, choosing to stay at the sanctuary. The two children and Paris, however, opted to seek out Jerla Morel. Bo had yet to speak when Haniwa asserted that she had no right to vote. Haniwa believed that besides Voss's family, no one from the village of Alkeni had the right to decide, as they would only betray her family. This statement was chastised by Voss. After all, for the past 17 years, it was the village that had sheltered their growth. Ultimately, the silent Bo spoke up, choosing to support the search for Jerla Morel. The final vote was 4-2, to two, causing Magra to sigh deeply within. Following the directions in the letter, the Tesla raft continued along the river, with a long way still to go to reach Jerla Morel's House of Enlightenment. The journey was inevitably arduous. At this moment, Paris called out to Voss, informing him that Magra's wound had become inflamed and they needed to find a place to go ashore to rest. As evening approached, they arrived at the foot of a mountain. Paris tended to Magra's wound while the others started a campfire. After a brief rest, Magra called the two children over. During the conversation, an inexplicable sense of heartache and reluctance emerged. Haniwa thought her mother was afraid of the new world and tried her best to comfort her, not realizing that this heartfelt talk might be their final goodbye. In the afterglow of the sunset, Magra took out her father's keepsake and placed it against her chest, perhaps missing him so much that tears also began to flow. 
Night fell, and Kofun stood guard alone for everyone, gazing at the blazing campfire. He thought about the day's conversation and couldn't help feeling a bit of regret. However, he knew that as long as he was with family, any disagreements were temporary and everything would eventually be all right. The next morning upon waking, Voss discovered that something was missing. All their weapons were gone. Magra was woken up by the commotion and immediately felt for her pocket, only to find that her pouch was missing too. This sent her into a panic. She told Voss that it had to be found immediately. Voss, however, informed his wife that without weapons, the thief could be a threat, especially since witch hunters were known to roam the area, making it dangerous to stay. He asked Magra what was so important in the pouch that she was so anxious. Magra replied that she didn't want to discuss it. She just wanted to quickly recover it as it was an irreplaceable keepsake left by her father. Seeing Magra so resolute, Voss took his two children to the nearby forest to search for her lost item. They looked for any suspicious traces, listening intently for distant sounds. Eventually, they detected a faint hum and followed the sound to a place strewn with trash. Relics left by ancestors were everywhere. A strange structure caught everyone's attention. The children had never seen anything like it and were naturally curious. Voss explained that this was probably the work of scavengers from the Opeol tribe, who are active at night and sleep during the day. It must have been them who took their belongings. After hearing this, Haniwa didn't hesitate and wanted to investigate further. Her father immediately stopped her, telling her that the scavengers outnumbered them and they needed to strategize. Haniwa argued that she could handle herself with the advantage of sight, especially since the scavengers would be asleep. She felt it was worth scouting out the situation. Voss, considering the urgency of retrieving the item, eventually agreed to let his daughter go alone. This was a strange dwelling constructed from everyday trash. Haniwa approached quietly, tiptoeing inside. The passageway was narrow and full of forks, with an alarm system made of ropes tied to metal cans. She walked a long time without seeing a soul until she came to a clearing. In the center stood a pole adorned with various ornaments and weapons. Upon closer inspection, Haniwa found her mother's pouch among them. Overjoyed, she quietly took it. Just as she thought she had succeeded, she felt someone's intense gaze upon her. Then a chicken scream alerted Voss and his son, who immediately sprang into action. Kofun was the first to rush ahead while Voss fumbled rapidly and strode forward. They soon came upon Haniwa, who was lying flat on the ground. Voss checked for her breathing when a masked man, burly as a bison, charged them, wielding his weapon and sweeping it around with deadly precision. Even Kofun, with his sight, couldn't fend off the blows, and a strike to his abdomen took him down instantly. As the brute readied his fatal blow, Voss tackled him to the ground. In that moment of respite, Kofun hurried to check on Haniwa. Voss took a kick, but then immediately grabbed the attacker's thigh, and with a twist of his arm executed a chokehold that immobilized the attacker. Haniwa awoke to the surprise of seeing her assailant in combat, recognizing a familiar mark on his stomach. Just as the brute was about to meet his end at Voss's hands, Haniwa called for a halt, sparing his shitty life. When the mask was removed, the brute turned out to be a young man named Boots. Back at their temporary home afterwards, Haniwa returned with her mother's belongings and also brought along Boots who had attacked them. She needed to explain the man's background to everyone, especially to her own mother. It turns out that ever since Gerlamarl had entrusted the two babies to Voss, he had set out for the House of Enlightenment. But when he passed through the Opeyol tribe, he stayed for a year before leaving. It was during this time that Gerlamarl, unable to control his hormone urges, dated a tribe woman, and soon they had a son, who was the young man, Boots, who could also see. Later on, when the Opeol tribe heard that witch hunters were active in the area, they fled, abandoning Boots to fend for himself because they felt he was different. It was clear that Boots was a sighted man. Haniwa pleaded with everyone to let Boots stay, asking her father to take him along on their journey. Paris was the first to object, and Magra also distrusted Boots, a man who lived by stealing rather than working, which made the others wary. However, Haniwa believed that in this world, those with sight were definitely trustworthy and reliable. Boots did not disappoint, immediately demonstrating his sincerity and even kneeling before Voss to kiss his arm, pledging his loyalty to the team. After everyone dispersed, Voss and his wife held each other and shared their heartfelt feelings. Magra pulled out the pouch for Voss to examine. It turned out to be nothing more than a bell. In Voss's view, this ordinary object might hold deep paternal affection. 
He consoled his wife, urging her not to grieve over Gerlamero's hormone affairs. But Magra seemed calm, unbothered. She was more concerned about the future of their children and the sudden appearance of Boots. Meanwhile, the Tesla raft had run aground on the riverbank. Despite Kofun's efforts to push it forward, it was to no avail. The quiet arrival of Bo startled Kofun. From their conversation, Kofun learned that Bo was a shadow who could move silently in secret and is undetectable in smell. Long before Haniwa and Kofun were babies, she had discovered the secret of Voss's family. However, she kept silent, believing that sight was a power, not witchcraft, an ability that should be protected, not destroyed. Bo continued, saying that she had glimpsed many secrets in her life and understood what people truly desired. Not everything was as nice as it seemed on the surface. For instance, the new world Kofun longed for, and its king Jirla Morel, who abandoned them only to have a child with another, was a painful revelation for Kofun, sinking him into deep thought. Just as they were talking, Voss and Paris arrived. Kofun informed his father that the raft was stuck and could only be moved at the next high tide. At that moment, Paris sensed imminent danger. Sure enough, a horse's neigh followed by the presence of a powerful witch hunter was detected. Voss sensed trouble and quickly told his son to run. They hurried to the camp, calling everyone to grab what was essential and rushed to the nearby woods. Witch hunters were already on their way, their hounds picking up scents, with the air thick with the smell of death. Soon after entering the forest, Kofun stopped in his tracks, nervously looking at the surroundings. From all directions in the dense forest, countless witch hunters were silently closing in, indicating a fierce battle. The scene then shifts back to the storyline of Queen Cain, who amidst nationwide protests, pulled the lever of the dam's floodgates in a fit of rage. Thousands of people were engulfed by the floodwaters in an instant. With such a heartless act, she coldly rode away in her Ferrari carriage. Now, in a land barren and covered with withered grass, Queen Cain basked in the sunlight, changing her clothes. Her attendant picked up the bell that signified supreme status and carefully placed it in a bag. Feeling the cold breeze from the riverbank, the queen couldn't help but reflect on her unrestrained life. She was starting to feel hungry and stood up to find something to eat. However, after calling out several times, there was no response from the coachman. Suddenly, she stumbled upon a body, confirming that it was indeed the coachman, which threw her into a panic. She drew a dagger for protection, but was met with cruel mockery. It turned out that two shadows had attacked them. The queen called out to her attendant, who had now become a ghostly spirit, and then she was forcibly dragged away by the two shadows. Not far from the riverbank, a textile factory was bustling with activity. The agitated noises indicated that the slave master knew the shadows had captured new labor workers. He slowly approached, feeling the struggling woman before him. Bending down, he touched her fingers and was surprised at her sexy body. The woman's delicate skin delighted him, as the more tender it was, the more perfect the satin they could produce. He then warned the captured woman that no matter who she had been or what her status was, she was now a slave here and must obey his orders. Otherwise, she would face severe punishment. The queen screamed hysterically, begging for hormone mercy and warning that such treatment would bring retaliation. The slave master listened, a cold smile in his heart as he touched her cheek and slowly slipped a rope over her, telling her to be good and that she was just a slave here. Amid her hoarse cries like a giant baby, Queen Cain shed her crocodile tears and was thus reduced to a slave. Meanwhile, Voss and his family were under pressure to deal with the approaching witch hunters. Hanawa hid her mother and Paris in a hollow tree before hurriedly leaving. More and more witch hunters were relentlessly narrowing their search. With a furious strike from Voss, everyone joined the battle. Boots fought bravely, charging into the enemy ranks and wreaking havoc. Even Kofun drew a small knife, taking part in the bloody carnage for the first time. As a shadow, Bo killed the enemy with ease, each strike lethal and merciless. Inside the tree hollow, Paris sensed something was amiss. She reached forward and was shocked to find that Magra had disappeared. The fighters, hearing Paris's cries, immediately ceased their actions. By the time Voss arrived, only Paris was left. The scene shifts to a desolate sandy beach where Magra moved slowly, calling out the name of the witch hunter general demanding to meet with him. The general dismounted his Ferrari horse slowly and approached the approaching familiar voice. As the bell rang, the general immediately realized who was coming. He knelt on one knee, took Magra's hand, and called out a long missed title, Princess Magra, bowing his head in salute. Now Megra sat inside the tent, demanding that the witch hunter general treat her family well and not harm them. 
To carry out the princess's command and the queen's wishes, the general changed the order from kill to capture alive. Then he voiced his doubts once again. As Magra recounted her story, a piece of secret royal history came to light. Decades ago, as the kingdom's emperor lay on his deathbed, his two daughters came to bid farewell. The elder daughter, Cain, spoke of her unwillingness to part, her right hand caressing the coin that symbolized power. She assured her father she would do her best to govern the nation. In a touching moment, Cain called her younger sister Magra to the bedside, comforting her. Magra was suddenly pulled close by their father, who whispered a few inaudible words to her only, grow up quickly and rule the kingdom. After some years, Magra came of age and immediately organized the royal council to seize the throne. Unfortunately, she was thwarted by the general and her attempt ended in failure. She loved her sister deeply but also wished to fulfill her father's last wish. Having failed to take power, she had no choice but to flee the dam, taking with her her sister's lover, Gerla Morel, who realized that staying in the kingdom would mean control, not happiness. And so he chose to escape with Magra willingly. When the general heard this, all the mysteries unraveled. It turned out that the queen's proclamation that Gerla Morel had killed her sister was a lie. The pursuit of Gerla Morel and his child was merely an act of vengeance. Yet even so, the general chose to remain loyal to the queen. In his heart, he was determined to capture everyone and bring them all back to the dam. Meanwhile, Voss and his companions were still trapped in the mountains. With a roar, the enemies around him were struck down. With each accurate strike, no one was left alive. Sensing the witch hunters closing in again, it took just a second to pinpoint their location. A swift spinning slash followed by a backhand strike, and he achieved a double kill. At that moment, Kofun arrived, informing his father that the number of witch hunters was increasing and the situation was becoming dire. Haniwa and Boots also arrived with even worse news, claiming that they had seen Magra killed. Everyone was shocked. Voss couldn't believe it was true until his daughter tearfully informed him that she was almost certain their mother had perished, having found her mother's pouch. Holding his wife's most treasured keepsake, Voss had to accept the grim reality. There was no time for grief as a large number of enemies were approaching. Boots suggested he knew a secret place to hide. With no better option, they had to retreat for the time being. Boots led everyone through a dense forest and finally to a cave entrance. Inside, pitch darkness enveloped them, devoid of any light. Not long after entering, Bo realized there was no way back. It was at this moment that Boots slammed shut an iron gate and declared they had arrived, revealing that it was a trap of his design. He locked everyone in, distrustful of the group, and then left abruptly, leaving Voss and his companions seething with anger. The indestructible iron cage plunged the group into despair. Kofun was furious beyond measure. He had previously advised Haniwa in private to be wary of Boots, whom he believed was cunning, and suggested they sever ties with him. Suddenly, a noise echoed, and the entire cage began to shake, then started descending. As the camera pulled back, it became clear that the cage was an elevator. Voss instructed everyone to brace themselves, suspecting further dangers below. In the pitch-dark environment, to discern what was beneath them, Haniwa was forced to ignite Gerlamorel's letter, using the faint light to make out a narrow cave passage. After groping their way forward for some time, they reached a lit area and saw a figure standing ahead, who they learned through conversation was a woman. Just as Voss began to inquire about their location, a group of people appeared, moving swiftly. Before they could retaliate, the group felt a numbing sensation and quickly lost consciousness. Sometime later, everyone awakes, only to find themselves confined within a cave. Paris informs the group that they were likely knocked out by poisonous mushrooms, and the light in the cave came from glowing insects. This place was rumored to be an underground refuge inhabited by deranged individuals who had lost their humanity. Voss comforted everyone, reasoning that since their captors hadn't killed them, they must have another purpose and would likely send food eventually. They just needed to wait for the right moment to seize an opportunity for escape. Time passed, and as the group settled into sleep, Paris and Voss huddled together, reminiscing about the past. Paris had once saved Voss and brought him to Alchemy Village. Later, Voss, having found stability, rescued Magra when she was in distress and eventually married her. Decades had flown by, and now, with everything changed, the sense of loss was profound. Paris expressed deep regret for not protecting Magra, resulting in her tragic end. Although Voss grieved, he knew he had to remain strong as the team's spiritual leader. Whether they could escape or not, he couldn't afford a mental breakdown. While they were conversing, Paris sensed that the iron door was being opened. A woman came in. 
Voss quickly subdued her with a swift move. Her purpose was to rescue the group. After explaining her intent, Voss released his hold. Through conversation, they learned that the underground city was densely populated, making escape difficult without her guidance. The group was somewhat dubious, questioning why she would rescue them. That's when she revealed a shocking truth. It turned out that, like everyone else, she had been deceived by Boots. The only difference was that she was Boots's mother, Delia, from the Opale tribe. As she described their past, a hidden tale unfolded that astonished everyone. Since Gerla Morel had abandoned her and their son Boots, Boots's uniqueness had led to isolation and rejection by the Opale tribe. The dark environment of his upbringing twisted his psyche. That explains why an adult Boots decided to take revenge on the entire tribe. One night, he brutally murdered tribespeople while they slept, leaving only Delia and himself. Delia was willing to help Voss and his companions escape, but on one condition. Once out, they must help her kill Boots. She believed that only by killing her son could she atone for everyone's sins. Haniwa agreed to her request. With this resolution, Delia finally let the weight off her chest and couldn't help but break down and weep like a baby. Not long after, under Delia's guidance, the group came to an elevator. The blinding light confirmed that the exit was above. Voss surveyed the situation and quickly arranged for everyone to get on. At that moment, Kofun discovered how the ladder worked. There was a gate valve switch that required someone to operate it from below. Once the elevator ascended, another gate valve switch had to be activated for the elevator to come back down. Just then, noises came from within the cave. Delia urged Voss to act quickly while she went to hold off the approaching enemies. With no time for hesitation, Voss instructed everyone else to go up first, staying behind to cover their retreat. With a forceful pull, the elevator began to ascend slowly. Just then, a scream echoed from the cave. It was Delia, presaging the imminent arrival of a large number of enemies. Voss, grabbing a wooden plank at hand, prepared for battle against a coming attacker. Their struggle caused the machinery to stop. Kofun realized something must have happened to his father. Voss, relying on sound to locate his target, struck each lethal punch, sending the attacker to meet Satan in hell. As Voss struggled to his feet, he continued to pull the lever, fighting against time to bring everyone safely to the top. Kofun rushed out first, hurrying to activate the corresponding gate valve switch above. Meanwhile, Voss faced an onslaught of more attackers. In the midst of his fierce combat, the elevator above encountered a malfunction. Perhaps the pressure was too great, and then the cable snapped, sending it plummeting down all the way to the bottom. Amidst the billowing smoke, all fell silent. Kofun and Haniwa gazed anxiously below when a shout let them know their father was still alive. A bloodied hand reached out from the mist. It's Voss who had decided to climb up by bare hand. With a massive enemy force approaching, he had no choice. The vertical stone walls, covered in slippery moss, presented an obvious challenge. The 10-meter climb was daunting, to say the least. Yet, bit by bit, he groped his way upward, encouraged by the voices of his children, the only reason he could keep going. As time passed, Voss's strength nearly faltered. That's when he pulled out his combat pickaxe, throwing it up in a last-ditch effort. Fortunately, Kofun caught this lifeline, and after a strenuous effort, Voss was finally rescued. Everyone's tension eased at last. At the same time, back at the witch hunter's camp, the general failed to find any trace of Voss and his group, but captured a young man. On closer inspection, he was indeed Boots. The scene shifts to the storyline of Magra after the revelation of her true identity. In accordance with the princess's wishes, the witch hunter general shifted the mission from a kill order to a capture policy. However, the hunters only managed to apprehend Boots. Magra pretended to embrace Boots, which promptly sent the general away, before hurriedly inquiring about the whereabouts of Voss and the others. Boots chose to dodge the question, brushing it off with a few vague words. Earlier, Boots had witnessed the army bowing down to Magra and learned of her identity as the kingdom's princess. Knowing that Voss and his companions had been dealt with in secret, he thought of a new strategy. Boots persuaded Magra to let him become her right-hand man. With the advantage of sight, he believed he could help Magra secure her power. As Magra was considering this, a disturbance suddenly arose outside the camp, prompting them to investigate. The general, at that moment, was discussing how to proceed with their mission. From the conversation, it was learned that Queen Cain, Magra's sister, had been taken hostage by a slave master. Now, the general had received a demand for ransom to be delivered to a specified location. Magra couldn't believe that the heavily guarded dam could be compromised until the general handed her a coin, confirming the truth of the matter. It was hard to imagine what misfortune had befallen the royal family. 
Just then, Boots shared shocking information with Magra. Thanks to his visual capability, he had spotted the messenger, a shadow, whose normally impeccable stealth was now fully exposed. The scene shifts to Queen Cain, who was enduring inhumane treatment, a result of her defiant nature. While others toiled, she shirked, leading the patrolling overseer to discipline her with a combination of blows from a club. The queen, attempting to voice her anger, was promptly knocked unconscious with a single strike. Upon awakening, the queen finally snapped, revealing her true identity to her fellow workers. By the next day, the slave master had heard of it. To verify her claim, he had the queen bound and laid on a table to check if there was indeed a coin on her chest, as the legend said that the sovereigns of the land of the blind bore a coin, symbolizing their power. Despite the queen's fierce resistance, the slave master found and removed the coin amidst her agonized screams. Next, the slave master thought to extort a ransom from the army, but things never go as expected. The shadow sent to deliver the message to the army was intercepted. Thanks to Boots's assistance, the general captured two shadows, and on a bitterly cold winter day, under the general's ruthless interrogation, the surviving shadow revealed the queen's location. Armed with this information, the general approached Magra with a plan to lead the army to the site immediately and rescue the queen. After hearing the general's report, Magra decided to join the army on their mission and insisted on bringing Boots along. And so, with Magra in tow, the general led the army on a grand march towards their destination. Meanwhile, Voss and his companions were savoring a brief moment of tranquility in the aftermath of their ordeal. They had arrived at a vast expanse when suddenly Voss halted. Confused by his abrupt stop, Kofun hurried forward to check on him. However, the sight that unfolded before him left him astonished. What they beheld was the lavender path mentioned in Gerlamarel's letters, which led directly to the House of Enlightenment, indicating that Gerlamarel's kingdom was close at hand. Nestled within expansive mountains, fields of lavender stretched as far as the eye could see, a sight to behold. In the distance, the massive ruins of broken walls testified to the former glory of their ancestors. The destination of Voss and his followers was the legendary kingdom said to possess the gift of sight. After crossing flat plains, they approached a frozen river. Voss cautiously treaded on the ice, moving forward. After a considerable journey, they encountered a dilapidated stone hut and decided to rest there temporarily. Haniwa and Kofun, who had gone out to gather firewood, discussed the impending reunion with their biological father, Gerlamarel. Kofun cautioned Haniwa not to harbor high expectations, leaving her somewhat bewildered. Boots's lessons had taught her the terrifying aspects of human nature. On the other side, Voss and Paris were pondering the same issue. Both were acutely aware that the children's choice to face a new environment meant they would inevitably be outsiders in a land filled with sighted individuals. The next day, everyone continued on their journey to the new kingdom. After traveling for a while, they were all struck by an appalling stench. That's when they discovered a bull's head frame by the roadside, adorned with skinned animal carcasses, including human remains. Kofun noticed knots in the rope that carried a message and quickly discerned its meaning. It was a stark warning against entry, stating that trespassers would be strangled. The note was signed by Gerla Morel. The chilling message startled Kofun, and the spectacle of bodies hanging from the frame made them consider retreat. Voss rallied everyone, questioning the sacrifices they had made and the purposes they traveled so far to obtain. Collecting their emotions, they continued their journey. Along the way, bodies stripped of their skin hung on either side, sending shivers down their spines and chilling water down their pants. At the same time, a textile factory controlled by the slave master was quietly approaching a great danger. The defiant queen was on her last breath, knocking away the food brought to her with a direct swat. Sensing the queen's attitude, the slave master couldn't help but start mocking and ridiculing her. He began to recount rumors about the queen's brutality, saying that she had killed a lover just for him snoring like a pig and a servant for an unpleasant body odor. Anyone who served her with the slightest negligence was also killed outright. It was understandable that such a cruel and perverse monarch would remain defiant now. The queen couldn't stand to listen any longer and in agitation shook her bell. However, this only brought a brutal beating from the supervisor. While the queen was suffering, the army had already arrived quietly near the factory, with Boots scouting the terrain. Once he had a clear view of the situation inside, he immediately returned to the army to report. After some analysis, the general decided to take the field himself. 
Before he left, he instructed everyone not to act rashly and to wait for his signal before making a move. The general silently entered, touching the route he had already scouted. He quickly killed the first overseer. Then the second overseer died innocently to meet Satan, followed by the third. But as he moved to kill the last one, he slipped. The slave master, hearing the overseer's cries, immediately sought his dagger. At that moment, the queen's workmate acted, stabbing the slave master and flipping him to the ground. The queen, hearing the noise, trapped him, channeling all the pain she had endured into her strength. By the time the general arrived, the queen had exhausted all her energy. After being rescued, the queen was overjoyed to see the general. He then called for Magra. Magra, bending down, reached out to touch her sister but was firmly grasped. Decades of separation touched again, yet the familiarity made Magra very sad. As she was about to leave after breaking free, the queen immediately called out Magra's name. The sister's appearance seemed to jolt the queen's nerves. She decided to confess everything she had done. As the queen narrated her story, the general's face gradually hardened and Magra was terrified, unable to understand why the queen had done such horrifying deeds, destroying a dam and slaughtering tens of thousands of citizens of the kingdom. The general could hardly believe his ears. He grabbed the queen, expressing his fury, wondering how he could explain this to his army. However, the queen said that she had done all this only to uphold the dynasty and that she was not at all wrong. The general slowly stood up, struggling to control his emotions. Megra was also shocked beyond words by her sister's actions. On the other side, Voss and his group arrived at a narrow valley, where the utter silence put Voss on high alert. He held back the rest of the party, then had his sighted son describe the surroundings. At that moment, Paris also sensed danger. Upon hearing this, Voss decided to find another path to try. Haniwa disagreed, believing her father was being overly sensitive, and turned to forge ahead. Voss quickly grabbed her, unsure how to explain his concern to his child. Then, he thought of a method, picking up a stone from the ground and tossing it forward, a simple test that made the ambush within the valley all too apparent. With years of combat experience, Voss told everyone that it was a sound trap. When the enemy moved again, Voss just listened carefully, then hurled his iron pickaxe at the target. A chicken scream followed as the enemy fell off the cliff to end his chicken life. At that moment, Haniwa discovered a weapon dropped by the enemy, a bow and arrow that certainly wasn't made by a blind person. Haniwa wanted to retrieve it for use, but Bo stopped her. After understanding her intent, Bo suggested it was safer for her to retrieve it. Using the skills of the shadows, she approached the fallen enemy, her movements quiet and calm. Soon, she reached the body and expertly secured a knife, then slowly found the bow and arrow. With the weapons in hand, Bo twisted back around and began to return, all the while keeping an eye on any movement above and treading with extreme silence. Suddenly, an arrow fell, and Bo hit the ground. Haniwa rushed to check on her, but Kofun shouted, causing the ambushing archers to cease their attack. Just then, a figure appeared in the valley. It was one of Gerla Morel's guards. They were told to pass through this area and cross a bridge to reach the House of Enlightenment, where Gerla Morel would be waiting for them. Concerned about Bo's injury, Paris inquired if there was a healer at Gerla Merrill's location. The answer was that only Gerla Merrill's children could pass through. All others must return the way they came. Voss found this hard to believe and asked for confirmation. The answer remained the same, and the three arrows at their feet told them Gerla Morel was serious. Kofun couldn't comprehend Gerla Morel's rule, and the group fell into deep thought. Kofun condemned Gerla Morel's actions, vowing never to seek him out again. But Haniwa began to argue with him, saying only Gerla Morel could help them at this moment. Voss interrupted the dispute and told his children that they had come too far and paid too high a price to turn back now. He had come to understand why Paris once urged them to read and later supported their search for Gerla Morel. It was because the children were a new generation with sight, destined for a higher purpose, not to live out a mediocre life with their blind father. Kofun tried to get Haniwa to persuade their father, but Haniwa agreed with him. They indeed lived in different worlds. From the moment they gained sight, they were set apart, and their parents would never truly understand their thoughts. Hearing his daughter's words, Voss was filled with a mix of reluctance and sorrow. He told his daughter that there were no different worlds. In his eyes, they were his only world. Even as a blind man, as a father, he could still see them, but the time to part had come, and with a heavy heart he bid farewell to his children. After the goodbyes, Voss hoisted Bo onto his back and walked away. 
Watching their father's retreating figure, the two children felt sad. Paris stayed with the children, offering comfort. She told them not to worry, and as the elder brother, Kofun needed to protect his sister. The two should be united in heart, because from that moment on, their relatives could no longer be by their side. She hoped they would take care of each other and face everything. After sharing these words, she hugged the children and then also left, feeling her way into the unknown. The scene shifts back to the textile factory, where the general found Magra and shared his thoughts. After much deliberation, he had come to believe that the queen was no longer fit to rule the kingdom. He wanted Magra to make a decision, to overthrow her sister and take control of the kingdom, to lead the army and rebuild the Kane Empire. Since learning about the queen's destruction of the dam and the massacre of the people, the general considered the repercussions of making this public. He knew that to reveal such news would unleash a storm of blood and violence within the army barracks, potentially bringing centuries of the dynasty to an end. After the general's analysis and guidance, Magra agreed with his opinion. Now the queen had only two options, relinquish her power voluntarily or disappear from the world. At the same time, Boots was being bewitched by the Queen's cunning colleagues. The shrewd Queen Kane had anticipated the General's strategy and had cast her net wide from the beginning, bribing key individuals. Later, Magra confronted her sister with the General's decision. The Queen flew into a rage, denouncing it all as nonsense. She declared herself as the chosen of the gods, and the idea of relinquishing her throne was inconceivable. Magra sighed. Even at this point, her sister still hid behind the pretense of divine right, beyond redemption. For the future of the dynasty, she resolved to make the grave decision to eliminate her kin. The queen smiled coldly as she sensed Magra's departure. Magra, upon returning, reported everything to the general, who had anticipated the queen's inflexibility. Together with Magra, he went to confront the queen one last time, ready to make the final decision. However, the queen suddenly feigned weakness, admitting her faults and agreeing to abdicate. She pretended to approach the general and handed him a piece of rope with encoded information. As the general puzzled over it, he was suddenly stabbed from both front and back. Even in all his strength, he found his power drained in that moment. With a forceful push, the queen hastened the general's demise. Magra, sensing the general's injury, rushed over only to find it was too late. The queen reassured a panicked Magra not to worry, assuring her everything was under control. Meanwhile, Haniwa and Kofun finally arrived at the House of Enlightenment. Seeing their biological father for the first time left them somewhat dumbstruck. Gerlamorel stepped forward and embraced them, easing their unease. He then led them to the New Kingdom, where they learned that the place had once been a prison, but was now transformed into a base by him. Passing through a corridor guarded by the blind, they met what Yerla Morel referred to as family, siblings of the same skin color, which left Haniwa and Kofun somewhat overwhelmed. Everyone in sight was one of Gerla Morel's children, an incredible thought for Kofun. Gerla Morel then took them to where they would stay, a place with electricity, hot water baths, and even the legendary shower gel. The novelty and strangeness stirred changes in their hearts. When Haniwa took her first bath, she seemed to really enjoy this new way of life. Kofun, however, felt the opposite. Come bedtime, he even sought out Haniwa, asking to sleep together, as an unsettling feeling made him miss their blind father. The following day, Gerlamorel showed the two around, giving them a tour of the family's living quarters, including the extensive library within the base. Wandering through this sea of knowledge left Haniwa utterly astonished. As they stepped out, Kofun inquired about the whereabouts of those siblings' mother, to which Gerla Morel said there was no need for one. Kofun accused Gerla Morel of being irresponsible, but Gerla Morel explained that as a chosen one, he was tasked with the mission of propagating a new generation of humanity, a cause for the annals of history. He hoped Kofun would understand. Haniwa then reproached Kofun, reminding him that here, at least, they were not ruled by fear. They were not heretics, but free individuals. Following Gerla Morel's lead, they arrived at the power station, which was built using the knowledge they had gained. Here, Kofun and Gerla Morel clashed again. Kofun scoffed at the so-called kingdom, questioning the point of constructing these power facilities for just a few people, and whether the blind could use them. Gerla Morel, patient as ever, urged Kofun to look at the bigger picture, emphasizing that this mission was significant and the road ahead was long. At this point, a fellow brother also educated Kofun on the importance of thinking about the future of humanity. These stirring words left Kofun feeling bewildered. Elsewhere, Voss and his group, now homeless, found a tribe. But due to the threat of witch hunters, the tribe refused to shelter them. 
With no other choice, Voss had to leave Bo behind and seek a new path with Paris. Considering the situation of their children, they decided to settle nearby. Meanwhile, Gerla Morel received some special visitors. The conversation revealed that these people had come to capture someone, fulfilling an agreement. The deal they had made involved the newly arrived Haniwa and Kofun. The visitors demanded the son of Voss, but Gerla Morel disagreed. After some negotiation, it was agreed that Haniwa would be handed over to them. All of this was overheard by Kofun as he passed by. When he turned around, he ran into a brother and informed him of the situation. However, taking advantage of Kofun's distraction, the brother knocked him out. At this very moment, Haniwa was still engrossed in the novelty of her surroundings. Gazing at her reflection in the mirror, she was intoxicated with her own image, completely oblivious to the imminent danger. Kofun and Haniwa, who had just arrived at the New Kingdom, had not had the chance to experience Gerla Morel's fatherly love before being sold out by their biological father. At the scene of the transaction, a fierce haggling took place. Kofun later regained consciousness, only to find himself locked in a room. He rose in anger, pounding on the window. Meanwhile, the so-called brother was directing guards to transport Haniwa. Witnessing this scene, all Kofun could do was helplessly watch the tragedy unfold. After Haniwa was placed on a carriage, she vanished into the night. Jorlamorel seemed unfazed by his actions, suggesting this wasn't his first time engaging in such dealings. When the cell was opened, Kofun charged at Gerla Morel, intent on killing him. He demanded to know what Gerla Morel had done to his sister. Gerla Morel tried to console him, claiming it was all a war strategy and that Haniwa would be treated gently and not in danger. But faced with this hypocrite, Kofun furiously lunged at him. The pain-stricken Gerla Morel, annoyed, touched his bruised lip and then retreated to his room, instructing his man and handing over a pistol. The scene shifts, and Kofun is escorted by two guards to an open space. The way they hold the gun, it's not hard to guess that Gerla Morel intends to execute Kofun on the spot. Kneeling on the ground, Kofun is acutely aware of his fate. As the gun barrel presses against his forehead, he closes his eyes in agony. In the nick of time, Voss arrives just in time to save him. To rescue Haniwa, they head back to the base without further ado. With a sweeping slash, Voss takes down the first guard, deceives the enemy with a feint, and then turns to cleave the last one. The pair quietly enters the base, and Kofun, now familiar with the layout, shares his plan with his father. He has thought of the power station, to cut off the base's electricity supply, naturally gaining an advantage on the battlefield. Voss understands, and so they begin to operate separately. Voss struck the walls with his weapon and taunted verbally, provoking Gerla Morel to reveal himself. Before long, he sensed the hidden enemy sneaking into the library. Sliding the knife in his hand, Voss assessed his surroundings, using his hearing and touch to master the layout of the room. After some time, with the enemy still not making a move, Voss intensified his taunts, calling Gerla Morel a coward, until a voice finally emerged from the darkness. Gerla Morel then told Voss that he couldn't be blamed for Haniwa's abduction, because the person who took her specifically wanted Voss's children. This revelation shocked Voss, as the person turned out to be Voss's own brother, but also his blood enemy. The news sent Voss into a rage, his wildly swinging blade evidencing his fury. In the gloomy light, Gerla Morel stood motionless, gun in hand, watching Voss. With the advantage of sight, Gerla Morel landed three heavy blows on Voss. The fallen Voss quickly moved, adjusting his position while listening for incoming sounds and dodged another attack. After a precise block, he unleashed a powerful counterattack, grappling with Gerla Morel who was no match for Voss in close combat. He managed to stab Voss. Voss drew his dagger, not forgetting to continue his mockery even through the pain. In the blink of an eye, he pounced accurately on Gerla Morel, who still managed to escape. Suddenly a gunshot rang out and Voss's shoulder was hit, but Gerla Morel appeared again, gun in hand, declaring he would end the battle without further ado. Just then, the hum of machinery faded away. It's Kofun who had shut down the power system. In the pitch-black environment, Voss was in his element. His elusive presence sowed fear in his enemy. Gerla Morel fired his gun aimlessly, trying to bolster his courage. In the next second, Voss was upon him. Amidst the chaos, Gerla Morel scrambled towards the exit, attempting a desperate escape. But Voss wasn't about to give him that chance. The captured prey could never escape from the palm of his hand. After several twists and turns, Gerla Morel was firmly within Voss's range of attack. At that moment, Gerla Morel's other son arrived with a gun, intent on rescuing his father. Just as he was about to get closer, Kofun arrived just in time to subdue him. 
Gerla Morel was already in a chokehold by Voss. Amidst his pleading cries, Voss did not kill him but instead gouged out his eyes. This was the first time he had ever shown mercy to an enemy, motivated solely by the fact that Gerla Morel was Kofun's biological father. Kofun watched everything unfold with indescribable emotions. Meanwhile, a large group of witch hunters was being brainwashed by the queen. After a series of fabricated proclamations, everyone was convinced that the general had died by suicide. Megra seized the moment to interject that, with the general's death, there would be no more heretics in the world, and the witch-hunting army would be disbanded. They were to abandon their outdated superstitious beliefs and forge a new world, embracing new entities. Having a sighted army was the next plan for the kingdom. Magra then announced the new military orders to advance towards the House of Enlightenment. The queen listened to Magra's speech and jokingly commented that her sister was quite interesting. She understood the purpose of canceling the witch hunts. It was all to protect the family. In front of her sister, she boastfully said that she could have had sighted children too, but Gerla Morel had refused. If she reached Gerla Morel's new kingdom, she was determined to plant a seed of sight like Magra had done. Once everything was arranged, the main forces set out on their journey. At the same time, in a room now ablaze, the general's body maintained its last stance. The general, immortalized in the roaring flames, seemed to narrate a life of unresolved discontent. In another part of the world, Voss, accompanied by Kofun and Paris, was making his way towards their destination. They needed to swiftly reach the land where Haniwa was. Listening to his son describe the world below the mountains, Voss knew all too well that an even more perilous journey was about to begin. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.